something about where I've uh, come from before starting the physics. So I'm from Sussex University in the UK. Uh, and uh, in terms of a map of the UK, there's London. Uh, our university is located uh, roughly there in Brighton, even though it's called University of Sussex. Um, and this is our campus, nice and green and, and pleasant, like it should be. But actually, when I was looking at this map last night, I realized this is not accurate because I remembered that I've been told a story that Queen Victoria had said, build me a railway line straight south from London to the coast because I want to go swimming. Uh, and this doesn't look like it's going uh, straight south to the coast. So I checked on Google Maps. And this is the real railway line in, in red. And you see it does indeed roughly go south uh, with a few sort of diverting loops. Indeed, one loop uh, is diverting here, roughly where I live, and there's a reason for that, but that's another story I'll tell you if you're interested later. And if you go down the railway line straight to the coast, you get to Brighton, where the university is. And at Brighton, you'll see a couple of things like this is one, um, which apparently is sort of Indian-inspired. Uh, so it's not, this is not traditional English architecture at all. Uh, but that's what you'll find in Brighton uh, as one of the sort of landmark buildings. And the other thing that Brighton is famous for is its pier, uh, which is the this construction going out to the sea, uh, which you can walk along, which was built long ago. Uh, so anyway, enough of the uh, sightseeing. Uh, just to say a little bit more about what I do, because what I'm going to talk about is different from, uh, from these bits of research. So at the moment, we're very much engaged in uh, sensors and well, quantum sensing and metrology in a project that's being led by Birmingham University. This is part of the UK National Quantum Technology Initiative. Uh, and as part of that project, we're interested in making, for example, cold atom sensors for gravity, gravity gradients, magnetic fields, rotation, time, and quantum imaging. My particular interest is in rotation. Um, and. Uh, adjusting the mic a bit here. Uh, my particular interest is in rotation, where we're designing uh, atom chips for rotation sensing, with the aim in the long term of having sort of quite complex uh, cold atom laboratories built on a chip. That's not something that I'm directly involved with, but that's sort of the long-term vision for what we want to do. Uh, so uh, my own particular work in this cold atom area, and this makes a whole separate talk uh, which uh, I'm quite happy to give if there's a slot to fit it in. Um, this, uh, uh, this particular piece of work is about making guided structures for ultra-cold atoms. So this is maybe on one to 200 micron length scales. And we've trapped the atoms here, in theory, uh, in, in arbitrarily shaped loops for, for cold neutral atoms. Uh, so that's the sort of thing I work on. That is done uh, with microwaves. And uh, we've also designed lattices, which use radio frequencies in ultra-cold atoms, uh, in this case, above or below uh, an atom chip. And we're able to make this cold atom lattice in principle, which has other applications and where you can have, for, for, uh, as a possibility, quantum information processing using microwave pulses. But I don't go into that in this talk. And I did realize there is a bit of cold atom physics I do which is, uh, I do find this sound is sort of cutting in and out. Is it OK? Yeah? Is, is the sound OK? It's just my imagination then. Um, so, so there is a, a, a bit of cold atom physics I do, which is related to decoherence studies. And that's something we've just put on the archive recently. And uh, that's this situation involving radio frequency dressing. Again, it's all part of a separate talk. Uh, and what the decoherence uh, is about is how these radio frequency traps, which are used to manipulate atoms to hold them in interesting structures uh, like rings and pancakes and so on, how they actually leak and, and decohere. Uh, and that's a whole separate bit of theory, which is in this archive uh, preprint. And all of that work I'm not going to talk about now if I've got any time left, uh, uh, but it is all reviewed in these two review articles, one in Journal of Physics B last year and one that just came out in advances in atomic molecular optical physics this year. So, OK, that's what I'm not going to talk about, but I, I, I will if uh, asked to at some point. Uh, what I am going to talk about is this pseudo-mode method. 
So this is uh, really going back to the theory of, of decoherence and trying to analyze essentially non-Markovian open quantum systems. Uh, and that's the theme. So it's a little bit different from the cold atom work. So just to set a bit of context, then here we consider, uh, because we haven't had this yet, although I expect that's going to come in other talks, the idea of a quantum system which is interacting with its environment. Uh, and in general, that's a two-way interaction, although one tends to think of it as a one-way interaction for Markovian systems. You know, so excitation in the quantum system can go out to the environment, and that excitation can also come back uh, into the environment, in, uh, back into the system in principle. Examples of these kinds of quantum systems with environments can be leaky cavities, so a cavity with imperfect mirrors, and also photonic band gap systems, but there are many, many other examples. For example, in uh, photosynthesis, and it, the list goes on and on and on. Many systems can be described uh, um, with uh, uh, an analysis based on decoherence. And a very common approach, so you know, I made these first few slides a little bit didactic, uh, but also to set some sort of uh, notation up for later on. A common approach is to use Fermi Golden Rule. Now, Fermi's golden rule works well when you have weak coupling or if you have um, a density of final states for your decaying quantum system, which is without structure. And this talk is about what happens when you have structure. But if you don't have structure, then it's flat as a function of, say, energy or frequency. And you can use the golden rule to describe the decay rate of this quantum system. So the idea is that you have, let's say, a simple two-level system, just to keep it simple. For now, it wants to de-excite. As it does so, excitation is promoted in a bath or reservoir, uh, and you get a promotion to one of a number of final states. You can work out the decay rate from 2 pi over h bar times the matrix element squared. And I use this G lambda here. Lambda is a label which labels these energy states uh, times the density of states, which here I call rho lambda. And that's the standard Fermi-Golden rule in the notation of this talk. And that will just say then that this population that you had here, or probability uh, of excitation, decays in time exponentially with the decay rate that you work out from golden rule. And that's the simple standard situation. So now we go to a more complex situation where we have some kind of structured reservoir. So if you imagine that, for example, that density of states or the coupling element varies with energy. So here we have some peaks and bumps and lumps and things. Uh, which vary with uh, energy, and here's the energy scale of a two-level system, for example. How can we describe that? Well, basically, mathematically, one simple model is to use, a, at least for optical systems, is to use a, a, a glorified Jaynes Cummings model, but it's a multi-mode Jaynes Cummings model. Uh, so this is uh, Hamiltonian that's split into three parts, the energy of the Bath states, so the sum over A dagger A type pieces, the energy of your atomic system, so this could be just sigma z, which is the same thing as this commutator I've got here, so it's the two-level energy. And then an interaction part, which is critical here, which has the coupling constant, which is varying with the index lambda, or varying with energy, uh, and uh, the part of the Hamiltonian that's responsible for exchange of excitation between the uh, atomic system, for example, or whatever system it is, and the bath. So, annihilating excitation from the bath and promoting states in the atomic system. That's just to set up all my notation. This coupling constant G is the thing that feeds into what's sometimes called the spectral density. It's often these days labeled J. Um, for historical reasons here, I'll use the symbol D. So it's a function of omega. It feeds into that, so this spectral density is more like mod G squared times the density of states, the same quantity that comes up in Fermi's golden rule. Now, to do this pseudo-mode development, which is what the topic is, uh, we make a number of approximations. Uh, we uh, don't make an approximation about the strength of the coupling, although I'll make some comments about that. We do make, for the moment, a two-level system approximation, but that's not essential, as we see later. Rotating wave approximation is made already in this Hamiltonian, if you look at the interaction. And we're going to choose a very simple initial condition. Uh, I can motivate generalizing it later, but to make the analysis simple, I'll just look at a single excitation in the atomic system, so it's excited, and, the, and an empty bath, which will later get populated by that excitation. So this is quite a sort of basic level of problem. Uh, and now we will have a look. You can do a numerical simulation of this. 
Uh, but you have to be careful to avoid artificial recurrences due to when you numerically simulate, you have a finite size model and not something with an infinite number of bath states um, that requires caution. So one way of uh, analyzing the problem analytically or numerically uh, is to do a state vector expansion. Sometimes this is called essential state analysis. So we have a coefficient CA multiplying the, the case where the atom is excited and the bath is empty and a coefficient C lambda multiplying the case where the atom is de-excited and there's an excitation in the lambda place in the bath. And that's our initial ansatz and you plug that into the Hamiltonian and when you do so you'll end up with a couple differential equations for those amplitudes. So the uh, rate of change of amplitude CA uh, is a sum over amplitudes uh, C lambda with couplings G lambda and each one of those C lambdas couples back to the CA. And so these uh, differential equations are coupled together. Now you can eliminate, to try and solve this, you can eliminate the C lambda just by integrating this equation and substituting it in, into the one above. And that gives you an integral differential equation for CA alone without having the Bath state C lambda in, inside there. And this integral differential equation uh, in the form that I've written it here, has this memory kernel, which I've written as big G, function of tau, tau being a time difference. Uh, and now you see that because you have an integral differential equation, in principle, this is a non-Markovian system. There's some memory in the system because this integral that you're doing here is an integral over different times of the amplitudes. And so it looks non-Markovian at this point in time. The memory kernel big G, uh, comes just from that substitution that we made up here to be the sum of the g lambda squared times some uh, phase factors that vary in time. So tau is a time difference and that figures in these exponentials. Uh, and that can also be written in the limit that you have a dense uh, set of states as an integral over rho g squared as I'll call it. So that's density of states times mod g squared with that exponential factor. So this rho g squared plays such an important role in everything that follows um, that I give it this name reservoir structure function and up to a normalization, this is the same thing as uh, the spectral density j that is talked about. So now we have uh, a simple integral differential equation that describes how this system, uh, how the atomic system will decay for an arbitrary spectral density. Uh, uh, what can we say about it? Well, I'm going to make a couple of digressions, at least, uh, well, if I have got time to make the digressions, which is looking good because the clock is decreasing, yeah. So, uh, first digression is, uh, and this is not the pseudomode business, uh, it's more the traditional weisskopf wigner theory, uh, and that says, what happens if the bath is flat? Well, if the bath is flat, then this memory kernel that I just worked out turns out to be basically the Fourier transform of a constant because the g lambda squared here inside the memory kernel are not varying with index lambda. They're not varying with frequency. And so the integral becomes basically the Fourier transform of that exponential, which becomes a delta function. So when that's a delta function, then the integral differential equation that we had before now just picks out one single time and it now becomes a Markovian equation. So we don't, the, the integral here over different times collapses because g of tau becomes a delta function. We just have a simple differential equation just like the one I had for Fermi's golden rule in the beginning. It's exactly the same and that gives you some decay rate for the flat system. So again, this is without structure and it's the, that's the sort of standard analysis just to make the link to that. I make a very brief digression. I think I'll go fast through this because I, I lost a bit of time at the beginning uh, on master equations. So master equations uh, are more sort of start their derivation from an operator basis. So this is just standard textbook stuff. So hopefully those of you who are interested in this topic have already made themselves familiar with it. And here I have two slides where I'll just point out a few features. Normally when I teach quantum optics, I spend two lectures on this topic. So you can appreciate that a few details are missing here. But the standard uh, approach for the master equation is to start off with uh, Schrodinger equation of motion in an interaction representation 
And then uh, here's my particular interaction for this problem, as before, but now in the interaction representation, which gives some time dependence. And then you iterate it. You go to second order, because you need second order differential equations, ultimately. So you integrate, first of all, the Schrodinger equation, and then you substitute the result of this integration in the Schrodinger equation to get this uh, double characteristic double commutator that eventually gives you this Lindblad form of a master equation. You have to make a number of key approximations, though. First approximation is that the bath is very large, and large in quotation marks, and kind of unaffected uh, by the effect of the decaying system. This is one approximation that I will not make in the analysis that, that follows, but is in the normal master equation derivation. And secondly, in the master equation derivation, eventually, you have to make an approximation of short correlation times. So this is just following the usual derivation to get to a master equation at the end. But to simplify these time integrals that basically come from that memory kernel, you have to have short correlation times, so Markov type approximations, and you have to make this second approximation. And eventually you'll end up with a master equation for um, the uh, decaying quantum system. So you know, appreciate I've jumped over a lot of steps in that, but just to sort of bring up the sort of familiar sort of things. So that's through two sets of key approximations. What I'm going to do next is without making any of those approximations. They make other approximations, but it doesn't make those approximations. So this is the slide I showed you before. Remember, we developed an integral differential equation. There it is. And in a key component of that is this reservoir structure function, big G, which is defined as this integral over rho G squared. Now, what the pseudomode method does is it looks in particular in interest at the poles of this function, rho G squared, the spectral density. So we extend things into the complex plane. So here is our spectral density, let's say, is a function of omega. Uh, and now we look in the complex plane. Maybe there's some poles here uh, marked with, that are connected to these peaks. And the original uh, integral for the memory kernel would have gone maybe from the origin, maybe over here somewhere, to uh, plus infinity in frequency space. And now I do two things. I extend it to minus omega with some small error, perhaps. And I also close the contour and, and turn it into a contour integration. And then provided that this is in the form of, of poles of uh, uh, some kind, they don't have to be simple poles, but here we'll assume simple poles to, to keep it simple, uh, then we find that that uh, uh, original memory kernel that we had can now be expressed in a different form as a sum of residues uh, multiplying exponentials of pole locations, as you would get from the standard uh, residue theory of uh, complex analysis. So, so we've changed from an integral over an infinite number of uh, modes, uh, an integral over omega lambda, uh, into a, a finite sum depending on the number of poles. So in this example, there are three poles, and so there are just three terms in this thing. So now we notice something. So here's my integral differential equation that I want to solve. But now I've replaced g of tau by this expression, which involves residues and uh, some exponentials of pole locations. Otherwise, it's the same uh, kind of expression as before. And what we notice is that we can actually create this integral differential equation in a different way. And this is a key part of the development. Uh, we can create this integral differential equation from uh, these two uh, differential equations, which are similar to the differential equations um, that we had before involving C lambda. But now instead of C lambda, I've got here something called BL. BL is an amplitude which is associated with one of those pseudomodes or poles. So there's only three of these BLs in that example, B1, B2, B3. It's not an infinite number. Now, you can verify that if you substitute, if you integrate this differential equation, substitute it in here to eliminate the BL, just as we did in the case of the C lambda, you end up with this integral differential equation again. In other words, these equations synthesize this one uh, with the same memory kernel. It's just that the memory kernel is here in this residue uh, form. So by introducing these new quantities BL, which you could call the amplitudes of the pseudomodes, uh, you can uh, solve the problem for the amplitude CA, which could be the problem that you're interested in. What are the dynamics of the two-level system in this case? So we make that transformation. And now we have the same exactly solvable problem, uh, but in a different form. 
So we can compare the approaches for a single poll, is the question, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, R sub L is the residue of the ELF poll. So, there are three, so there'll be an R1, R2, R3. So it's just the residue from contour integration. So now we, we compare um, the, for the single pole the two approaches. Uh, so single pole can be a Lorentzian function for the spectral density, rho g squared. In this case, we have a single pole, and the single pole is at a, a location which is imaginary, of course, because there is this uh, big gamma function here. So now the, the, here are the two approaches. The original Barth equations involves an infinite number of equations uh, uh, with an index lambda, and you have to solve this kind of problem. And the pseudomode equations involve just two differential equations, as dif differential equations. So you have the one for the atomic amplitude, the one for the amplitude V1. <coughs> and that has a complex, uh, uh, complex number in the differential equation, but it's coupled back to the CA. Either way, you can solve that problem, but this one looks like it's an easier way. Now, there's a next step that I introduce because I want to make the connection to master equations. And the next step where I don't include all the details here is that using these amplitudes C, A, and B1, I can form an equivalent master equation. So I can say, you know, what, what, if, if you have this C, A, and B1, you know, where would I put those in a density operator? I can just construct the density operator out of those amplitudes, as you always can. It's side to psi. Okay. So I construct the density operator and verify from these differential equations that the density operator will satisfy this differential equation. In other words, it makes a master equation of the standard type. So we have a usual master equation with a decay channel uh, with a rate gamma and a Hamiltonian H0, which is of the James Cummings form. But there's a very important point to be made here, which is that we didn't make any of those approximations like Born approximation or Markov approximation. So this is truly uh, a, a non-Markovian master equation for the system without those approximations. Um, and uh, in this case, the, the dynamics is going to be exact, whether the coupling is strong or whether the coupling is weak. Uh, so this is just one pole in this example, yeah. But you could have more poles, and you can have double poles, and we'll see a more complex example. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we analyze the spectral density. Go back to these slides. So here there are three peaks. Well, basically, what you, uh, what you have to do is take an analytic form for this function, uh, and you look at it, and then extend it into the complex plate. And you say, where are its poles? And locate them. So you have to, you have, to have the analytic formula for this function. Uh, so the question is, the, the, this has more information than the three pseudomodes, but actually the, okay, so the, the poles will define this function, um, okay. um, but in addition to the poles, yes, the, there's a certain weight of, of pieces of that. That's additional information in there. So it's not just the pole locations, but the, the weights of the individual poles, which go into um, the parameters. Well, they basically go into the residues in there. So basically what you need is pole locations and residues, which are connected to the weights of those poles. And that defines this function. Now, if, if uh, I, I was going to make this comment later, but if, if you can't express this, this function analytically in terms of things that have poles, whether they're multiple poles or not, then there can be a problem with this method. And so one problem with this method would be if you have here a function which is square root of omega. And then you have a branch cut. And that's something different. Okay? And this method cannot apply to that case, or at least not found a way to make it apply to that case. But if you have a case which is sort of roughly, or basically all meromorphic functions is the technical term. So if you have any polynomial in frequency divided by another polynomial in frequency, then you can put it into this kind of form and, and what the key points that matter are where these poles are located. Okay. All the... All the dynamics will come from the three poles, yeah. In a way, we're extracting out the essential point from, 
from the spectral density. The, the yeah, this is this is not new. I mean, so I, I was first proposing this in '97, and you'll see the references later. So this isn't the sort of newest thing. Um, but I want to present the method. Another question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it's just analytic continuation. So it means that uh, if I go to my example here, so you can see that if you would take this function, so this is an example, if you take this function to frequency zero, you've got a certain value at frequency zero, which is probably unphysical anyway, and the analytic continuation is just to continue the function naturally to, to minus infinity. Yes. The pole. So it comes from this pole. So it comes. It comes from the analytic structure of the uh, spectral density. Okay. Good. I hope I get some extra time with all these questions. Maybe not. Though. Good. Um, so uh, that was the single pole case, and the single pole case will give you the well-known result, basically, of James Cummings dynamics in this case, which means that you get damped oscillations. Uh, with a modified Rabi frequency, and the Rabi frequency being modified by the decay rate, and that's that's well known. Now, an additional feature of this sort of this kind of approach to bath dynamics, which I find interesting, is that once you've solved the problem in this kind of way, you can always use one of those differential equations, and now it's the C lambda equation to find out from the atomic behavior what is happening inside the bath. So you can have a look in, in the bath. So this is a differential equation that you can use. And if you integrate that, then given a solution for the atomic amplitude or the two-level system amplitude, you can find out what is the bath doing as a function of, of time, what's happening everywhere inside the, the bath modes. And you can define, maybe I'll skip some details of this, but basically you can define a sort of reasonable physical spectrum, which depends on uh, the density of states times g times this c lambda squared and uh, look at how energy is dumped in the bath. So, for example, this, this is a case where you have a, a broad spectral density, density, but the coupling is very weak, and if you look at how excitation gets dumped in it, it's only over a narrow range, and that's the very reasonable weak coupling narrow range that you might find from Fermi's golden rule, and you see a Lorentzian dumping of energy in that, in that bath in that case. You can even do that as a function of time using these approaches. So in this case, again, still the single pole, what we see here is the same damped James Cummings model uh, oscillations of, of probability as a function of time. But at every instant shown by the green line here, which marks how time goes on, what you see in the panel below is what is happening inside the bath or the reservoir at that instant of time. And that's interesting because you see how the, the excitation seems to always come from the resonance position at the center here. And then it moves outwards into this double split dumping of energy, essentially a Rabi splitting that you get uh, as uh, time goes on. And at, at the end here, all the energy was dumped into the environment, into the bath, and you had the Rabi splitting due to the atom pseudo mode coupling showing there. Now you can do more complex systems. I don't want to do too many of those, but here's an interesting example which we've used as a model of photonic band gap. So the idea of a photonic band gap is that you have a modified density of states where over some region it is zero or it can be heavily reduced. And in this case, there's a dip that goes down close to zero. Uh, so there's a place where a two-level system is not uh, allowed to emit or is inhibited from emitting its photon. And we're modeling this here with Lorentzians because the pseudo method is very good with poles and, and Lorentzian type functions, polynomial type functions. We model it here with a positive Lorentzian superimposed with a negative Lorentzian to, to produce the gap. And that actually produces very sensible results in the modeling. So again, you end up with a master equation with two decay terms. Both of them are sensible uh, positive decay rates with different channels. Uh, that's why there's two operators, A1, and another operator, A2, for the decay channels. And a Hamiltonian, which contains the sort of things you expect in terms of the, the uh, A, A1 dagger A1 and A2 dagger A2, but also includes a new feature which is required when you analyze this model, which is the interaction 
between one pseudomode and the other pseudomode. So you now are forced to have coupled pseudomodes as well as having a pseudomode coupled to the atomic system. So that's quite complicated. But what you learn from that uh, as a picture is that there's a kind of pseudomode architecture. So the case we were just looking at is shown diagrammatically here, where you see the atom is coupled to one pseudomode oscillator. That's got its own decay channel. But that pseudomode is itself coupled to another pseudomode, which has its own decay channel. <coughs> and that's how we can read that, that uh, master equation that we just saw. Whereas the single pole case here, so this is a positive pole, if you like, or a positive Lorentzian and a negative Lorentzian. This is just a positive Lorentzian or a single pole, which involves interaction a single pseudomode which decays through that decay channel. We also started to see in this work from 2009 how, how the pseudomode could potentially be identified as being the sort of memory part of a, of a bath or a reservoir. If you start thinking about this in information terms, you can think that this quantum system, if it's got a non-Markovian dynamics, it wants to interact with the bath, but because it's non-Markovian, that means sometimes the bath returns energy or information back to the system. You get oscillations, typically. And we could see that these oscillations would be identified with the pseudomode holding on to excitation or information and then returning it to the system, whereas once the pseudomode itself decayed, there was nothing to come back to the atom, and so um, a return of excitation or information back to the system was impossible. So we tentatively uh, identify the pseudomode as the place where, the, where there's a bit of memory in the system. It's, it's the place where there's memory. Whereas when the pseudomode itself decays to these uh, uh, additional reservoirs, which are how we read those master equations, then that's kind of the non-memory part of the system. There's no memory there. It's, it's definitely all gone forever. Okay. So now, time permitting, I move on to several topics. I picked on three. There's actually sort of five or six that I could have selected. So I've got a few minutes left to talk about these. Fortunately, on the Fano thing, <coughs> I only selected one slide. So the main point about the Fano analysis was to, to generalize what I've just been talking about, which is talking about a simple example system with a single excitation to multiple excitation cases. So that was possible using this Fano treatment, which involved expressing uh, true modes of the system in terms of operators as a sum of discrete modes and uh, 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 integration of a whole load of a continuum of modes, and then comparing that to a different way of looking at it. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but basically the result of the analysis was, after a lot of hairy mathematics, uh, that we believe that the pseudomode analysis worked out for single excitations also works for multiple excitations. Uh, however, the mathematics was tricky, involving, for example, differentiating twice uh, delta functions and, and, doing all, and then integrating them again and all sorts of things. So we wanted to test this, and we tested it with a three-level system, which we then solved three different ways using Laplace transforms numerically, using the pseudomode method, and using another method, and all three agreed. So it seems the method is solid for multiple excitations. And that's more or less what, all I'll say about that. <coughs> and now a bit more about bath. Uh, well, bath memory. Did it say bath memory there? And pseudomodes. So a bit more about this uh, bath memory business. Some of you may have seen uh, that... Uh, uh, one approach to, for example, in this book, Theory of Open Quantum Systems, a very good book by Brian Petricioni, um, that uh, people like to express these uh, master equations not in the pseudomode form, where I have an additional variable, the pseudomode itself, or operator connected to it. Uh, by the way, this is sometimes called sort of making a non-Markovian system Markovian by extending it, by extending the size of the Hilbert space. That's essentially what's happening in the pseudo-mode approach. But if you don't do that, if you just stick with your atomic system space, uh, you can still try to make a master equation out of it. <coughs> but you end up with these time-dependent coefficients. So, for example, you end up with a time-dependent decay rate here. You try to do this, and this is in Olin Breuer's book for the same kinds of systems. So we could take that Lorentzian system uh, and try and simplify it down, and you'll find that uh, you can put the master equation in this form. Then you have this time-dependent decay rate, 
And, and worse, in my point of view, the time-dependent decay rate depends on the amplitudes involved in the solution of the density operator. So it's, to me, it feels very artificial to do that. And the pseudomode approach seems more natural because we don't have time-dependent decay rates. And these decay rates, by the way, go negative in certain situations, uh, which also seems a bit peculiar, although that may also be interesting to some people. Uh, so we wanted to see what is the connection between that approach, where you just look at the atomic system, and the pseudomode approach, where you have the atomic system and the extended degree of freedom, which is the pseudomode itself. And here we look at it for a single Lorentzian structure. So these two pieces of equations are just what I showed you on the previous slide. Over here we have the equivalent pseudomode master equation. So it's basically uh, James Cummings model with one decay channel. And now we take the density operator and we trace out the pseudomode. So we worked hard to have that pseudomode in there, but now we'll trace it out. And when we trace out the pseudomode, we find we get a, a master equation of, of the broglie petrucioli form uh, with time-dependent coefficients. And now we ask ourselves, what are these time-dependent coefficients, really? Well, they can be linked. So this coefficient A goes to the S of Breuer, and B goes to the gamma of Breuer. But additionally, from the pseudomode interpretation, we have a connection uh, between uh, the A and the B, or between S and gamma, and so on. Uh, and we can find that, actually, this coefficient gamma of T, the time-dependent uh, decay rate that's in the master equation for the atomic system alone, uh, is actually governed by what the pseudomode is doing. So it's basically a driving term for a damped uh, pseudomode equation model. Basically, uh, what's happening as the, uh, as the atomic system decays is it's uh, um, driving the pseudomode, which is itself damped at the same time. So, so the interpretation of this time-dependent gamma, I think, critically needs the, the pseudomode model to understand what's, what's going on. So last topic that I mention is uh, how to deal with entanglement, potential entanglement uh, in a bath. Uh, and this is uh, maybe three slides, two or three slides. Uh, and what we thought here, thinking about more quantum information things, was that this essential state analysis, where you expand in terms of an atom excited empty bath and then having a, a, a bath state excited somewhere, this looks very much like, for example, the, the a W state in quantum information. W state is a set of uh, qubits, uh, suppositions which look like this. So you have you know, 1, 0, 0, 0 forever, plus 0, 1, 0, 0 forever, plus 0, 0, 1, 0 forever. All of those in superposition make a W. All that's happening in this state is that those terms are not equally weighted. Okay, we have weightings uh, which depend on the Hamiltonian uh, dynamics as a function of time. So we thought then we could use quantum information methods to try and understand you know, what kind of entanglement do we have going on in the bath and between the atom and the bath and so on, and look at that in detail. So again, the point I want to make here is that the, using these kinds of approaches like pseudomodes allows you to analyze a bit deeper, dig a bit deeper into what is happening into bath dynamics. So uh, we used a measure of entanglement. I won't go into details as I'm running out of time, uh, which is called global entanglement, but basically it's just a question of finding across these now qubit systems, all the two qubit concurrences and adding them up, or looking at all the uh, uh, linear entropies of the individual qubits and adding them up. And uh, I miss out a bit of the detail of the analysis, uh, just to say that as a result of, of making that comparison, you can define for our continuous system so-called entanglement densities. And these entanglement densities are essentially uh, two qubit concurrences which are modified by the uh, density of states function. And these concurrences then uh, across the system can be used to define you know, what is happening in terms of entanglement. Graphically uh, is more interesting. So let's look just at this figure, which shows this uh, entanglement density uh, in the bath as a function of detuning from atomic uh, uh, two-level system resonance. And what you see is four spots where you have a high entanglement density Basically, it's a function of frequency in one direction and frequency in the bath in the other direction. Okay, so they're finished. I hope I can be just allowed to summarize. Uh, so basically, the pseudomode method then is a non-perturbative approach 
Uh, it's uh, restricted, though, to meromorphic reservoir structures, as I said, basically polynomial type functions. Uh, it is extendable to multiple excitations, we believe. Cannot cope with branch cuts. Uh, and uh, I think those are the sort of key points. Something I haven't discussed in today's talk is of what happens if the bath modes are dynamic in time, which is very interesting, but I won't cover that here. Future work is uh, what's currently under progress and about to come out is work on quantum Darwinism. Where again, we're analyzing what is happening in the, in the reservoir. Quantum Darwinism is about saying how much information about a system is inside a, a bath that's outside that system. And we can look at that in detail using this kind of approach. So finally, I acknowledge then uh, my collaborators over the years, so in particular, Brian Dalton, who's in Australia, but also uh, past PhD student, Konstantinos uh, Lazarou, as well as collaborators in, in Turku, and my uh, funding sources that were used for this kind of work. And there I stop. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so what happens when we try to generalize uh, the initial condition for the bath? So, for example, if I try to include temperature or a canonical distribution for the bath? Yeah, I, I, I believe it will be okay, but I haven't myself looked at that detail. So. Uh, in terms of the pseudo method, I think there's a, a piece of work to do to check that it, that it actually does work properly as I think it would. Um, it's not published, though. Controls on the imaginary uh, frequencies, like Matsubara frequencies. Mm. So one has to also include those. But yeah, anyway. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but happy to discuss in the break. Questions? And just to make sure, uh, for this particular initial state, this is an exact solution. Is that correct? Yes, and within the assumption of extending that integral to minus infinity, which for, certainly for optical systems is a very small error. Yeah, this is right. No, there's none of the, that's what I try to emphasize that there's none of these approximations of separating the, the bath and the reservoir uh, and so on, and the short time correlations. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> if, if one consider the driving terms, like laser pump, so still this pseudo method is applicable there? If there's driving? Yeah, if there is driving term. I believe so. It's, again, it's not checked. I believe it because of the, the analysis of multiple, multiple excitations was done with Steve Barnett, that analysis shows that the method works for multiple excitations. But to actually do it and test it, I'm always very cautious that's not done. You know, with the multiple excitations, what we did do was testing three-level systems, which is not a lot of excitation, but that was already very demanding numerically. Yeah. You know, so one needs maybe better to test those things, one needs maybe better numerical tests. But moment I, I believe it would work with the driving but I haven't proven that it works beyond the, the work with Steve Barnett. Okay, one more one last question. Okay if not let's thank the speaker. <laughs> <laughs>